This is Twit. This episode of Tech Break is brought to you by ACI Learning. Certificates open doors to entry-level IT positions and promotions for those already in the field. CompTIA courses with IT Pro from ACI Learning make it easy to go from daydreaming about that career in IT to launching it. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit to learn how you can elevate your skills. Well, storage is one of those things that all, especially all cloud services, are looking to expand and make easier and make it make it to expand and do it reliably, right? Well, Cheaper, what's going on with this new technology? Well, interesting enough, um, Lou's not driving this story because he's he works for Microsoft, so we thought, okay, someone else will. Now, we've all heard of the Doomsday Vault. It currently holds 1,145,693 backup copies of the world's seed varieties. Now, the plan in this extreme tech article is that a new vault would be joining them, and it's going to be the Global Music Vault. Interesting. Well, in order to accomplish this giant storage related task, the organization running the effort has tapped Microsoft as a partner. Together, they are embar embarking on a trial to achieve resilient long term archival storage. They will be using Microsoft's project, Silica, and working on a proof of concept to see if it will work for music storage. It uses wafers of quartz as a storage medium. The group's press release notes that while tape is still the preferred way to archive data, I beg to differ, in high humidity environments, tape is horrible. I have lost so many backups. Anyway, um, read read the article. It's it's worth doing. Sorry, I've got a fly going baking. Um, in anyway, the concept is that it can be baked, boiled, scoured, flooded, subjected to EMP and other ways to tamper with them without degradation of the data written in the glass. The mountain in Norway, where it's located, is also considered the safest location on Earth to a mixture of geological and geopolitical stability. Each quartz wafer will be the size of a drink coaster at 75 millimeters by 75 millimeters and two millimeters thick. Each plate will be able to store 100 gig of data. Data is added to the wafer via a laser that creates three dimensional nanoscale gratings and deformations. To retrieve the data, a polarized light is used to shine through the glass. There are machine learning algorithms to decode it. The group says the proof of concept should allow data to be be preserved for many thousands of years. Project Silica has been in the work for several years now. Okay, now this is cool. Um, however, like I said, tape is a problem, especially if you're in a high heat, high environment, uh, humidity environment, like Hawaii or shipboard. Typically, if you are um, so inclined and you have your DLT tapes, and they've been sitting on the shelf, even in an air conditioned building for upwards of two years. Uh, the last time I tried to restore a DLT from a tape that was more than two years old, large pieces of the magnetic media actually flaked off. Uh, to say that that restore didn't work was an understatement. To that end, I have been really, really hot on um, using optical just because I wanted something that was more reliable, that is going to last longer than two years in case we need to go and bring back some really sensitive, say, um, seismological or hydrophone data um, for research. Now, what I have been using, and I'm going to ask Mr. Ant to go jump to the next URL, uh, I've been using an optical jukebox. Now, one thing that's interesting is, um, five-dimensional glass memory, uh, which is related to this, uh, also an extreme tech story, um, is now starting to become reality. Now, the um, technology that I've been using has been Blu-ray. And Blu-ray is great because unlike CDs or DVDs, the recording media is not exposed. It is encased in polycarbonate and does not suffer from what's called laser rot. Um, the old laser discs, um, I lost several very valuable um, titles because um, mildew got in there and destroyed the recording media. 
Blu-rays are sealed. So I actually have been trying to get researchers to go to something like this. It's actually a system that will allow you to store to a NAS and then set rules for archiving. And the archive would burn to a Blu-ray and but keep the metadata online so you can still search and still you know browse the metadata but when you try to actually bring down the data it'll give you a interrupt and a message saying this is being brought back from cold storage or whatever term you use and issues an operator message to please take this disk pack you know with a certain number pull it off the shelf stick it mount it on the system and it'll bring back the data so you can get to it um Problem is, we're not talking about a ton of storage. You know, we're only talking maybe a couple terabytes. Ideally, with the five-dimensional storage that um, the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom has been creating, um, maybe a combination of the two sounds good. So, now, what I'm going to do is, Mr. Kurt and I have had many conversations about data archiving, and so, so has Lou. And a lot of people say, well, hey, data doesn't really exist unless it exists in at least three places. So I'm going to throw this to Kurt first. Um, how many times have you actually heard the corporate world get excited about storage? And does data only existing in two places get people worried? Um. The corporate world outside of IT operations tends to be aware of storage in the abstract. They assume that they have to have some because they have some on their laptop. Uh, but that's about all the detail they want to know. Um, and again, outside of the resilience group, I would say that most folks in the enterprise don't think about um, backup, about redundancy, about resiliency. They assume that it's someone else's job. And so they assume that it's going to be there by some magic uh, whenever they need it. Um, I find it fascinating. You know, we've been talking about storage along the lines of this idea for a very, very, very long time. Uh, I remember when conceptually people were saying this was going to be the future of storage in the last millennium. Um, you know, as, as you well know, Brian, uh, optical discs were around for uh, storing movies and transporting movies. Um, a long time ago. And so people have known that this was the inevitable direction we were going. To me, the interesting thing about the story is when you look at the difference between the theoretical maximum density of that storage unit and the actual density that they're going to be using, it's multiple terabytes versus 100 gigabytes. That tells me there is a ton of, of redundancy and error correction, uh, various bit check schemes going on, which is good because this is supposed to be the safest sort of archive. Now, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, and furthermore, I'm looking forward to it doing the inevitable drift down market once the proof of concept is put into place in some massively usable thing. On the one hand, in the enterprise, I think we'll start to see uh, internal petabyte farms uh, become the norm, uh, while on personal devices um, and uh, home storage area networks, we're looking at hundreds of terabytes um, the question then becomes for most of us, what don't we store? Um, as our storage online becomes the data equivalent of that kitchen drawer packed full of old wrinkled receipts that uh, many of us have to sort through just to find the, the spare set of keys. 
Um, I'm happy about this. I'm thrilled that it's going to be used for uh, what I think is a very good and noble purpose. I'm looking forward to it serving a second useful purpose by being the first major utilization of a technology that all of us, with any luck at all, will get to use before I forget how to use computers. <laughs> yeah. Actually, my interest in all this actually got uh, kicked off because of Google. Um, university Google accounts used to be unlimited storage, but they just started slapping the university or research groups with some very, very hefty bills. And so now lots of university research groups all over the world are probably scrambling to find another long-term storage media. And I'll tell you right now, the number of nine track tapes that have failed on restore is staggering. Um, even DLTs have had the problem. Now I'm going to toss a little bit towards Mr. Lou only because that um, Kintronics system that I happen to be pretty high on, which is an optical jukebox, is actually based on a Microsoft product. Um, obviously, Microsoft has some really, really interesting things cooking behind the scenes. And Mr. Liu, you're, you're up to your armpits in the office, Microsoft office world. Um, has there been any kind of rumors or any kind of things that might be coming up on how Microsoft Office is handling data archiving? Because remember, there's backup, but then there's archiving. So are you nearline or offline? Those hooks have been in the Microsoft world for ages, but are, do you know if they're getting dusted off? <laughs> now, like physical medium, I, I don't know, because obviously these are hidden behind yeah. in the data centers behind behind services that, um, you know, that, that we utilize for these types of things. So I think that that I'd probably I don't have a lot of insights into, but I can tell you that a lot of scenarios we've used or other services have used, you know, blob storage or archive storage in Azure. Um, that's a big thing. Um, you know, we have a lot of office services that are like, for instance, OneDrive and other things, SharePoint, they use a specific data technology that does have cold and warm and, and um, you know, cold storage that, that does archive things uh, behind the scenes. And this is, this is terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data, petabytes of data. Um, so I do know that they are utilizing these technologies, but again, they are abstraction layers above the physical medium. So like, I, I don't know exactly what the data centers are doing, because I'll tell you one thing, these types of data centers, especially companies like Microsoft and Amazon, they're highly guarded and their technology that they use and, you know, and how they, and who has access to, to the physical medium um, or even what they're using for the physical medium is again, highly guarded stuff, uh, even from people who work at the company. So I can tell you, I don't have too much knowledge in that, but I, what I can tell you is things are getting faster. Things are getting um, more efficient and we're getting just more storage and more availability from these things uh, and consistency across globally uh, from these, these storage mechanisms um, as days go on. Yeah. Very cool. Actually the university are uh, the research group that I work for. Uh, we would have a Blu-ray burner robot that would then use an inkjet printer to print um, the metadata on top of the Blu-ray. We'd make two copies of everything. One goes on the shelf for day-to-day -day use and, you know, pulling data off the archive. But the last one uh, actually goes to a salt mine in Utah. Um, ever since we had a big flood at the University of Hawaii and lost petabytes of data in the basements of a couple of buildings, um, researchers have had, had a wake-up call. And that's why I'm oh so excited about optical storage that can survive this. Because I'll tell you right now, DLT tapes, when a basement gets flooded, and even though the DLT tapes were in a, a locked um, storage cabinet, the cabinet got ripped apart and the tapes got crushed. I actually was wading through eight inch deep mud in the basement of Hamilton Library, poking around looking for the uh, servers that got torn off the shelves 
and I actually got slung around the basement. Um, so yeah, I to whoever's running this Microsoft um, project, I would say please bring it to market because there is certainly a need and the research community will kiss your feet because <laughs> I can't tell you how much data we've lost. You know, ship shipboard leak, shipboard sinking, we've lost tons and tons of data. Um, it's a big, big, big problem. And I, for one, am really excited. Can you tell?